Hello, you have a missing tooth. You've got an option to replace that missing tooth of an implant, a fixed bridge which connects to the adjacent teeth, or a removable appliance. Most people would, refer, would prefer something that's not removable. The removable appliance does fill the space, but if you eat food with the removable appliance in place, food collects around it. If it's on the, the upper teeth, the appliance goes across the roof of your mouth, which people don't really like. As I said, food collects around it, so most people would prefer an implant or a fixed bridge. So let's talk about when you use either one, the fixed bridge or the implant. Let's first talk about implants. This patient presented with a bridge that was decayed, a fixed bridge. Now, a fixed bridge connects to the adjacent teeth. If you, you wonder, why do you call it a fixed bridge? Well, it's like a bridge over a river, with the river being the edentulous area where the tooth is missing and the land being the tooth on either side. So this bridge goes across the river, the missing area, and connects to the teeth on either side. In this particular case, I removed the bridge and we had enough bone. This is called alveolar bone or the alveolar process. And you measure the alveolar crest from the alveolar crest to the floor of the sinus. And in general, the smallest implant is eight millimeters, so there was plenty of room here for an implant. It doesn't matter if the implant goes into the sinus a bit, but that's not bone. So you want as much of the implant as you can to be in bone because the bone grows into the implant or osseointegrates. So in this gentleman's case, when I removed this old bridge, there was decay under the bridge and we had to do a root canal on the back tooth and it was decided that we would place an implant after we did the root canal on the back tooth and then do individual crowns on the adjacent teeth. It's easier to keep an implant clean than a fixed bridge. With a fixed bridge, you have to floss under the bridge. And additionally, you have if you're just missing that one tooth, you have to prepare the adjacent teeth for the bridge to fit onto. So in general, if the missing tooth is not in the aesthetic zone, that's the upper anterior teeth, maybe back to the bicuspids, you generally prefer an implant because you don't have to floss underneath it and you don't have to prepare the teeth on either side. But I'm gonna talk about why you, you often don't prefer implants in the aesthetic zone. Many times there you would prefer a fixed bridge. We'll get to that here in just a moment. So in this case, I remove the old bridge. The bridge was connected to the second molar tooth and the second bicuspid tooth initially. This one was decayed underneath the bridge so I had to do a root canal. So when we replaced it, I replaced it with a crown on the second molar a crown on the second bicuspid and an implant to replace the missing first molar tooth. And so the patient can floss between it. He doesn't have to floss underneath it like he does with a fixed bridge. And it's just like having another tooth. Now, this patient had an implant right here. This begins addressing why I'm not a real fan of implants in the aesthetic zone if the patient has a high lip line when they smile. If this person had a low lip line when they smile, meaning and they smile, they don't show the gum line, then implants in the aesthetic zone are fine. But it's very difficult often to control the gingival line, the gum line, once you place an implant. You can see how in this case, the, I didn't do this case, but the per, this, person came into my office as a new patient and she wasn't happy with the gum line and the fact that this bone is very thin and if a person has a very high lip line when they smile sometimes you can see the the implant if it's a titanium implant shining through the bone we now have zirconium implants which, which are tooth colored and that's not 
such an issue, but there are some issues with zirconium implants. So these are just things to consider. You don't just throw an implant in to the uh, missing tooth in the aesthetic zone. Now this is a patient of mine that we did a full mouth reconstruction. He was missing the posterior teeth and so I had to do sinus lifts and bone grafts and implants back there. And we also restored the anterior to teeth. This tooth was lost. They have veneered and restored the other teeth. We're gonna do sinus lifts and implants in the posterior. Then I placed an implant here because this gentleman had a very low lip line. When he smiled, his lip did not come past the middle of the front teeth. So this is the implant and you can see how the gum line on this lateral incisor is a little higher than the gum line on the adjacent lateral incisor. That was not an issue though, because when he smiled, he had a low lip line, meaning he did not show the gingival line. If, if this person had been a woman that showed tooth and gums when she smiled, I would not have done an implant there. I would have placed a bridge. Now this is a complicated case. This young woman was 18 and she had retained baby teeth as well as spaces between the permanent teeth and the baby teeth. And she just, of course, a young woman is not going to like the way that looks. You can see baby tooth here, baby tooth here. They have real short roots, so you can't restore that tooth. Here's a retained deciduous or baby tooth. And so the trick is this case is like a Rubik's cube, but cube, it takes a lot of planning. You don't just restore it. You plan it significantly before you restore it because when we, these teeth come out, the spaces are not exactly right. So we had to do some orthodontics first to get the spaces right for the restoration and include some implants onto which to fix the bridges. So you can see here's the baby tooth, on, the retained baby tooth on the right side, and here's the re retained baby tooth on the left side. So this is after the tooth was extracted on the right, and this is after the tooth, the baby tooth was extracted on the left. And this is what it looked like after it had healed. So the spacing has to be right to fill it in, or you'll have some funky looking teeth. So in this particular case, we used implants with fixed bridges and the smile was, the smile line was not a big consideration because she had a low lip line when she smiled, meaning she did not show the gum line when she smiled. That's the significant thing. When somebody smiles, how much of tooth display is there and is there display onto the gum so you show the gums and the tooth. And so it wasn't an issue. This is the other side. So in this case, I placed, after the orthodontic treatment, I placed an implant here as an abutment and then connected the bridge from the implant to the right central incisor. On the other side, I placed an implant here and used that implant as an abutment and connected a bridge from the implant to the left central incisor. Now you can see the gum lines are not symmetrical. This one is longer or higher than this one. That's one of the problems with an implant in the aesthetic zone. It's very difficult to control the gum line and it's also tricky to control the papilla, the gum in between the teeth, many times that will go away. In my practice, if I'm placing implants in the aesthetic zone, the aesthetic zone is the maxillary or the upper anterior area. Not a big deal in the lower because the lip covers the gum line. But if it's in the maxillary anterior area, the aesthetic zone, then if it's not an old farmer that just got off a tractor, you know, if it's uh, somebody that cosmetics is important, I'm probably going to place a fixed bridge, even though that involves connecting to the adjacent teeth, because I can control the gum line and make the gum line symmetrical. So you can see with this bridge, that's the only option we had here. The gum line is not 
ideal. It's not terrible. It's just not perfect is my favorite word. And it's not perfectly symmetrical. So you can see bridge, bridge, and we veneered and crowned this tooth, veneered this tooth. See, so when she smiles, the gum line doesn't come into play. So you could get away with an implant there with no problem at all. Now this is another case. You can see the implant was placed here and the implant looks good. The gum line looks look good. The only issue is she's got a high lip line. All bets are off when the patient has a high lip line because you've got to consider so many things. This bone is very thin right here. This is the same patient and the, the tissue is not very thick. So if it's a titanium implant, which most of them are, zirconium implants have just been invented. But if it's a titanium implant, that implant may shadow through the bone and the gum. And if the patient has a high lip line, they don't like it. This person was happy with the crowns. I didn't do this case. She came in as a new patient and wanted to see if I could fix it. Well, that's hard to fix because it's not easy to remove an implant. So you have to take those into consideration. Okay, fixed bridges. This is another case that this, two, this patient's upper left first molar had had endodontics, apicoectomies, which mean you reflect the flap and cut the tips of the root off, and she was still having pain with that tooth years after the procedure, probably had a cracked tooth. So what am I considering here when I'm deciding whether I place a fixed bridge, which I've done in this, this is the before and after, or I'm gonna place an implant? Well, the patient already had a crown on the second molar tooth. So half of the abutment preparation is already done. The tooth in front did not have a restoration on the tooth. The big consideration in the upper posterior region is the sinus. See, here's the floor of the sinus right here. So you have to have enough bone front bone, vertical bone height from the top of the bone to the floor of the sinus. This is called the alveolar crest. This is called the alveolar process. The implant is like the roots of a tree or like a fence post, a metal fence post in concrete. You gotta have enough of the post in the concrete for the post to be stable. If you've just got a little bit of post in the concrete, that post is not gonna be stable. So the, the Typical smallest implant, shortest implant, is eight millimeters long. I like to have at least six millimeters of implant in bone. I don't mind if a couple of millimeters of the implant is into the sinus. The problem is not the placement of the implant into the sinus. Oral surgeons do it all the time with all on four where they'll place an implant all the way through the sinus into the zygomatic arch if there's no bone in the posterior part of the maxilla. So the issue is not the placement of the implant into the sinus. It's having enough bone around the implant surface area for the implant to be stable. So in this case, there was not enough bone. See, this is after I've extracted the tooth and I've grafted the site. And you can see there basically was, after the tooth was removed, even though it was removed in sections, there basically was no remaining natural bone when the tooth was removed from the socket. Here's the sinus right here. So in this case, we, the patient didn't really want to do a sinus lift and bone graft. A sinus lift is when you lift the membrane of the floor of the sinus and you graft the sinus and you create new bone. Now, some people will place an implant in bone entirely created from the grafting of the floor of the sinus. I like to have at least two or three, three millimeters of the patient's natural bone if I'm doing a sinus lift and placing an implant into the grafted sinus. But that's just me. So in this case, we just replaced the missing first molar, which is the one that was extracted, with a bridge from the second molar to the second bicuspid. This is a false tooth. It's not an implant. This is what it looks like. This is a bridge. In summation, 
the areas that you run into the biggest problem with bone with implants are the lower posterior and the upper posterior the maxillary and the mandibular posterior. The limiting factor in the mandibular arch is the inferior alveolar nerve. You must have enough vertical bone superior to that nerve to place an implant. Now remember the shortest implant, unless it's what's called a fat boy, there's some of those that are six millimeters long, but in general, the shortest implant is eight millimeters. So you'd like to have two millimeters between the imp bottom of the implant or the apical part of the implant and the nerve. So that means in a perfect world, you'd like to have 10 millimeters of bone from the alveolar crest to the superior part of the alveolar nerve. In the maxilla, you're not worried about harming something because if you place an implant into the inferior alveolar nerve, you could give the patient a numb lip. In the maxilla, you're not worried about harming something because if the implant is placed into the sinus, that's not the issue. The issue is there's not enough bone around the implant. There's not enough surface area of the implant in bone to make the implant stable. So in both those cases, if there weren't enough vertical bone height between the alveolar crest and the inferior alveolar nerve or the alveolar crest and the floor of the sinus for the implant, you might go with the fixed bridge if you had teeth on both sides of the missing tooth area. If you don't have a, a posterior abutment tooth, say you're missing a first molar and the patient doesn't have a second molar, then a fixed bridge is out. You don't have anything to hook it onto. If you don't have enough vertical bone for implants, upper or lower, then you're talking about a removable appliance unless the patient wants to do a sinus lift and bone graft in the maxilla. In the mandible, if you don't have enough vertical bone for implants, you're pretty much out of luck because it's very difficult to raise bone vertically. You can widen it, but it's very difficult to raise it vertically without a rib graft or something like that. Okay, so again, back to fixed bridges. This is in the aesthetic zone. This is how the patient presented in my office. And she's missing these lateral incisors. And she didn't like the way that looked. Somebody had placed two three unit bridges here. And you can see how these missing teeth look artificial. See, three unit bridges. And hers is a tricky case because why? It's in the aesthetic zone and she has a high lip line when she smiled. Everything shows, teeth and gums. So we've got to be very conscious of the gingival line, the gum line. I can control the gum line with fixed bridges. I can't control it very well or as well with implants. So if the, imp if the missing tooth is in the aesthetic zone, I have to be very conscious. I take multiple photographs so I can study it and see how careful I've got to be. If she's got a high lip line, an implant in the aesthetic zone is pretty much out in my practice unless there are extenuating circumstances that I don't have a choice and have to place an implant. So you can see these are the old bridges. These are the missing teeth right here. And the dentist was a nice guy, but he hadn't created a gingival pontic receptor site. That's imperative if you want the artificial tooth, the pontic, to look like a natural tooth growing out of the gum. So I removed the old bridges and you can see the pontic sites are just flat. Well, what I figured out years ago is I want to create little foxholes in these areas so it looks like the tooth is growing the false tooth is growing out of the gum and you can create these foxholes with either a coarse football diamond or you can use radiosurge electrosurge some of you use laser you may be able to do it with that but what i'm doing is just sculpting that out so i create this little foxhole or divot in the gum then I placed a provisional bridge and let that heal. Sometimes I let it heal with a provisional bridge. Sometimes I take the impression at the same time. Now, when I did this case, I would let it heal for six weeks. 
and then come back and this is what you have. Now it's not always this dramatic. Sometimes it's less than that, but you can see how I've created a little gingival pontic receptor site and I've reprepped the teeth. And when you place the bridge, it's very important that the pontic blanch the gingival tissue. You don't want it to be so tight or so firm that the, the bridge won't seat, but you want the pontic to be in intimate contact with the gingival tissue. Possibly one of the one of the best technicians that's ever lived, Mr. Willie Geller in Zurich, Switzerland, told me this years ago. I worked with him for about 10 or 15 years. And he said, you always want that t the pontic tissue in the gingival pontic receptor site to blanch just a bit such that you have to hold the bridge in place for a little while to let that tissue compact a little bit when you're seating the bridge. Okay, so this is after. You can see how these gingival, how these pontics look like they grew out of the gingival tissue, but that's from creating the gingival pontic receptor site and having the tissue blanch in that pontic area when the bridge is placed. This is before, see how it looks artificial here, and after, again, before and after. Okay, another case, this patient had fractured this tooth, fractured that tooth, and so in this case, actually slept this root. His lip line is just right at the gum line. The other thing about an implant in the aesthetic zone, in the front, there's nothing harder to match shade-wise than an implant replacing a maxillary central incisor. No harder shade match in dentistry. Even if you restore the adjacent central, it's a trick because you've got an abutment in replacing an implant and an abutment replacing the missing tooth. And this one is just crown or a veneer covering a tooth. So you can have some some of the dark metal shine through. Now, if you use a zirconium abutment, that makes it a little bit better, but it's just a trick right here. There's nothing like replacing a single central incisor as far as a difficult shade match. So it was determined we would sleep that root, which means you leave the root in the bone. You cut it back and you leave the root in the bone. If it's a vital tooth, you do endodontics on the tooth. This one was not. Then you let you cut that tooth back to you cut this part under the gum. So it's under the alveolar crest and the gum grows over the root in the bone. And you let this heal for about eight weeks, three or three months, then come back and prep the teeth. And so this is the final bridge. There's the tooth that's replaced. And you can see with a bridge, I can control the gingival line. I can't control it so well with an implant. See in the papilla, you can control the papilla. So there's the missing tooth. Another case, she had fractured her right central incisor. Has tooth display with lips in repose. And when she smiles, you can see the tooth and right at the gum line. So I didn't want to deal with an implant in the aesthetic zone replacing a missing central incisor because I know if I go through the steps, I can control the gingival line with a bridge. I can't control the gingival line with an implant. So if the gingival line and the aesthetics is a big deal, I go with a fixed bridge, even though it means preparing the teeth on either side. The other thing that's nice about a bridge is, in many cases like this, I'll place a bridge here and I'll place a veneer on this too so I know I'm gonna have a nice smile. You think about what these people want. Do they want the tooth replaced? Well, if it's a rancher that just got off a tractor, that's probably all he wants. He just wants the tooth replaced. But if you've got a beautiful woman or handsome guy or somebody that cares about their looks, what do they want? A nice smile. So I can give them a nice smile with a fixed bridge and a veneer on a lateral incisor and a night guard. And if you're placing a full crown on an anterior tooth, I tell all my patients, even if they don't have restorations on their anterior teeth, don't bite anything with your front teeth harder than a hamburger. Why? Because this angle is bad. If you put something between your back teeth, you're biting along the long axis of the tooth. 
if you put something between your front teeth and bite, it's not biting this direction, it's pushing the front teeth this way. So that's why I don't like to prepare anterior teeth for full crowns unless I have to. I'd rather place veneers because you're preserving all the tooth structure. So if you're placing a bridge, you're forced to prepare the tooth for a full crown. So here's her final restoration. This is replacing the tooth. And again, we slept that root, we cut it back. So whenever you sleep a root, the root is like the roots of a tree in the ground. You know how the roots of a tree in the ground will hold the dirt up? or in, on the beach, they'll put piers in the sand to hold the sand up. Well, that's what the root of the tooth does. It keeps the gum and the bone up. If you take that root out, then this can look like a swayback horse and the gum and the bone can resorb after you place the bridge. So you want something in that hole. You could take the root out and graft it but it's simpler and I've done this for 40 years, hundreds of times, slept a root. The deal with sleeping a root is if the tooth is vital, if the patient has fractured, broken a tooth and the root, the nerve is still alive, it's still vital, you should do endodontics on the tooth before you sleep it. If it's non-vital, if the tooth is sclerotic, root sclerotic, non-vital, then you don't have to, but just be sure you cut the root back below the crest of the alveolus, below the bone line. Cut it back below the bone, gum, bone line, not the gum line, the bone line, and then the gum will grow over it. And this is what it looks like. And that's a very nice, you know, predictable result. So what I generally do, if you're missing a central, I'll place a bridge from the lateral incisor to the adjacent central, and then another veneer on the left central because we're talking about smile. And you know how the, the centrals and the laterals are generally about a half shade to a shade lighter than the cuspids. And so you can make them just a little bit lighter than the cuspids. This is another young woman that had fractured one of these centrals. Let's see, that one. Yeah, she had an old post and just fractured it right through here. See the lesion on the apex of the tooth? So in this case, since there was infection, I extracted the tooth and grafted the socket and then let that heal for two to three months. Be sure it's good and healed with a provisional in place. So this is replacing the tooth and we've, we wanted to lighten the shade of the teeth. So we veneered back to the bicuspid. So this is a fixed bridge from the lateral to the remaining central and then veneers on these teeth so we could lighten the shade of the teeth. And see, that's a very, I had the gingival, gingival ponic receptor site, so it looks like the ponic grew out of the gum. Very nice result there, in my opinion. That's a discussion of when do you, how do you replace a tooth? You've got a choice of a removable appliance, a fixed bridge, or an implant. You don't want to leave the space vacant because if you do, the shift will teeth will migrate into that sp space. The teeth are above or below it will grow up into the space and the teeth on either side will shift into it and it can throw your bite off and do all kinds of things with your occlusion and the long axis of the teeth. So you, in general, you want to always replace missing teeth. So you've got a choice of removable appliance, which people don't like as well because food collects around it. It goes across the roof of your mouth or around the back of the lower front teeth. So in general, people would refer either a fixed bridge or an implant. And this explains how you decide between an implant or fixed bridge. So that's the dental minute. These techniques work and they work every time.